Hi everyone. Today I'll be presenting a motion planning framework for dynamic monopedal locomotion on deformable terrain. My name is Daniel Lynch. My co-authors are Kevin Lynch, to whom I'm not related, and Paul Lumpenhauer, and we're from Northwestern University. This project was funded by NASA through the NSF National Robotics Initiative. I'd like to motivate this talk by acknowledging a reality of dynamic legged locomotion. It's really hard. It's contact rich, it has hybrid dynamics, and it often involves underactuation. When the terrain underfoot can yield, as is the case with soil, sand, or snow, achieving dynamic legged locomotion becomes even harder. Of course, animals seem to have this figured out on a variety of terrain and for a variety of sizes. For example, the ibex can scramble across scree to avoid predators, the arctic fox can jump on snow to hunt for food, and the zebra-tailed lizard can dart across sand to evade robophysicists. Robots are getting there too, but there's still plenty of room for improvement, especially as they get smaller and venture into more challenging environments. One particular challenge associated with walking or running on yielding terrain is that the foot can rotate while intruding. The zebra-tailed lizard shown on the right gives an example of this. This kind of stance phase foot motion is neglected in popular planning and control frameworks such as zero moment point control and hybrid zero dynamics, both of which arose from studying walking and running on hard ground. A related issue is that the ground reaction force depends on the foot's configuration and velocity. The risk here is that a naive control strategy that is unaware of this coupling could command infeasible motions. Our solution to this problem is to treat stance on yielding terrain as a continuous phase in the hybrid dynamics of legged locomotion, rather than regarding it as a disturbance to stance on hard ground. This approach is useful when the ground can deform substantially compared to the size and relative strength of the thing locomoting on it. In particular, we want to see if this approach can be used to plan monopedal hopping gates on yielding terrain. To find out, first we'll develop a model of stance on yielding terrain, which I'll call yielding stance from now on. Then we'll formulate our search for hopping gates as a trajectory optimization problem, which we'll solve using direct collocation. If we can do this, then we can use this framework to ask questions about locomotion trends, for example, how gates change with ground stiffness or with hopping speed. Before going further, it's worth justifying our decision to study monopedal gates as opposed to bipedal or quadrupedal gates. First, having only one foot makes it easier to focus on foot-ground interaction without having to coordinate multiple legs and without dealing with overlapping footsteps. Second, our monopod resembles the spring-loaded inverted pendulum template, which captures the center of mass motion of running bipeds and quadrupeds and which has provided a basis for the control of many running and hopping robots. In fact, as we'll see soon, one of the exciting things about our framework is that it generates slip-like gates, even though we make no assumption that this is necessarily the right way to hop on yielding ground. We're going to model yielding stance from the ground up, starting with foot-ground interaction. To do this, we'll turn to resistive force theory. RFT has been used in fluid mechanics for several decades, but recently it has also been used to model interactions between rigid bodies and granular media, such as sand, soil, or snow. One recent example is from Lee et al., who used RFT to predict the ground reaction forces arising from prescribed motor speeds applied to a small hexapod with C-shaped legs. Another example is from Xiong et al., who used RFT to avoid simultaneous foot rotation and intrusion for bipeds walking quasi-statically on granular media. Our work builds on these examples by using RFT to help plan through simultaneous foot rotation and intrusion in order to achieve hopping gates. We begin by modeling a flat foot and considering an infinitesimal segment of the foot located some distance from the center of mass. The local resistive stresses on this segment are approximately linear with depth, with coefficients that depend on the segment's orientation and intrusion angle. We then integrate these resistive stresses over the foot to find resultant forces and their points of application. These resultant forces also produce a moment, and together they constitute a ground reaction wrench. This approach neglects higher order effects such as inertial drag and material accretion underfoot, but at the low impact velocities typical of legged locomotion, the work done by these higher order effects is small relative to the work done by the depth dependent ground reaction wrench. Our monopod is fully actuated during stance, so we model force inputs ux and uy and a torque input u theta applied to the foot. We then simply place the robot's body on the other end of this actuator and enforce an upper limit on the distance between the body and the foot, which we call the stroke limit. A benefit of this simple model is that it is agnostic with respect to leg design. 
The leg connecting the body to the foot could be anthropomorphic, with hip, knee, and ankle joints, or it could be a parallel mechanism. The point is, these details don't matter as far as foot-ground interaction is concerned, and that's what this simple model allows us to focus on. After modeling yielding stance for our monopod, we turn to the motion planning problem of finding hopping gates, which is represented by a set of periodicity constraints. In a hopping gait, the configuration and velocity of the body and foot must match at touchdown when the foot first contacts the ground. Sometime later, the monopod must transition from yielding stance to flight in an event called liftoff. We assume liftoff happens when the body hits the stroke limit while traveling upward. We have to allow some horizontal displacement, otherwise the monopod would be hopping in place. However, rather than directly constraining horizontal displacement, we instead enforce a constraint on the forward hopping speed. Thus, we have a two-phase motion planning problem with boundary constraints. This problem could have multiple solutions, so we pick the one that minimizes the time integral of control effort squared. Minimizing effort is reasonable for biological locomotors since it relates to minimizing muscular exertion. It's also relevant to robots. For example, it could relate to minimizing motor current and therefore heat dissipation. Also, this cost function is convex, and this comes in handy when we eventually solve this problem numerically because it aids convergence. Finally, we use direct collocation to transcribe this problem to a constrained nonlinear optimization problem, which we solve numerically in MATLAB. After we put together all the pieces, we see that our framework can indeed find hopping gates. In this example, the foot mass is 0.25 kilograms, and the body is five times heavier at 1.25 kilograms. The stroke limit is set at 0.25 meters, and I'm requiring the robot to hop forward at two stroke lengths per second. There are three interesting things going on here. First, from looking at the horizontal component of the solution, the monopod's body moves forward at a fairly constant speed. In contrast, the foot only moves forward a little during stance, and therefore a small but non-zero control force is required to reposition the foot during flight. This is an extension of the slip template, which in contrast assumes a massless foot that can be repositioned effortlessly and instantaneously. The second interesting feature is that the body's up and down motion is nearly sinusoidal, which again resembles the slip template, even though the foot is sinking during stance. It's remarkable that this similarity emerges without any a priori assumption of a slip-like gait. Finally, looking at the angular component of the solution, the foot is nearly level when it impacts the ground. It then dorsiflexes immediately after touchdown, then levels out, and then switches from dorsiflexion to plantar flexion in preparation for liftoff. Our framework also enables us to look for locomotion trends by finding gates while varying model parameters. Here, we'll compare gates on ground that ranges from just over half as stiff as our original model to twice the original stiffness. First, notice that the body's forward displacement increases as the ground gets softer. This trend is also reflected in the foot's forward displacement, at least during flight. This suggests that on softer ground, longer strides might be necessary to hop forward at the same speed, possibly because the monopod spends more time and stance on softer ground. Second, notice that the body moves up and down sinusoidally, although the amplitude of this motion decreases as the ground hardens. Relating this trend to the slip template, this suggests that leg stiffness and ground stiffness are positively correlated. This agrees with trends we saw recently when trying to land a monopod softly on soft ground. Our framework also allows us to compare gates found for hopping at different speeds on the same ground. Looking at the horizontal aspect of the gates, we see something both reassuring but also interesting. The body and foot displace farther forward as the commanded hopping speed increases. This suggests that it's preferable to take bigger strides in order to run faster on yielding terrain, rather than taking more small strides. Again, this could relate to spending less time in yielding stance. To recap, we treated yielding stance as a phase of the hybrid dynamics of legged locomotion, and we modeled it with RFT. This modeling approach allowed us to find hopping gates on yielding terrain for a range of ground stiffnesses and hopping speeds. We found that slip-like gates emerge naturally, and these gates exhibit interesting trends as ground stiffness and hopping speed vary. One downside to direct collocation is that it produces fairly high-dimensional optimization problems, so it's difficult to draw quantitative conclusions about scaling and bifurcations. To address this, we plan to adjust our framework to use a lower-dimensional representation of the trajectory and controls. This will allow us to perform more thorough scaling and bifurcation analyses for a variety of parameters. 
With that, thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions.